Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We've been talking about how to handle pressures of life. And we said that pressure is the emotional and mental reaction to the ever-changing activities of life. And that stress is the physiological response of the body to pressure, while the stress is a harmful result of negative stress that the body is not able to absorb or adapt to. And we said that when stress is protracted, it can cause sickness and even premature death. And that is why it is important that we learn how to handle it. And we said that nobody is immune to pressure. It's a natural cause of life. So long as you're breathing, you must face it. But what makes the difference is what you do with it, how you handle it. And we said that your mental attitude, not your circumstances, determines the degree of your pressure. It's very important. Your mental attitude and not the circumstances determines the degree of your pressure. So a positive mental attitude is the key to learning to cope with pressure. If you want to deal with pressure, you must work with a positive mental attitude. That is the key to coping with pressures of life. And we said that every stage of life has its own peculiar pressure. We are looking at the childhood pressure, the teenage pressure with its associated rebellions. We said that even the newlywed, they face pressure in the areas of their finances, sex, even the roles that they play at home. And their parents also face pressure. Singles face pressure. Retired people, they have their own pressure. What about dating? That also has its own pressure, but I think I'll deal with that tomorrow so that we can talk on how you can choose the right partner. So I will be speaking to the women tomorrow so that nobody will come around and mess you, mess you around or waste your time. So tomorrow, we'll talk about that. But tonight, I want us to look at how to maintain a good mental attitude since that is the key to managing pressure. So how do we maintain a good mental attitude? There are four things that we need to do. The first one, you must know who you are. The first one is that you must know who you are. That brings us to the identity crisis. Today, a lot of people are having that crisis all over the world, especially the blacks. They are having identity crisis because they know that they are blacks. They know that they are not from where they are, but they cannot identify where they came from. So that is creating tremendous pressure in the lives of most of the blacks abroad. That identity crisis is there. But there are four questions that we, if we're able to provide answers to those four questions, it will help us to address this identity crisis. And the first one is, who are you? The second is, where did you come from? The third, why are you here on earth? The fourth is, where are you going from here? If we're able to answer those four questions, then 
we are close to solving the identity crisis that a lot of people are experiencing in life that is producing so much pressure in their lives. Then for us to be able to maintain a good mental attitude, the second thing that we need to address is that we must accept yourself as God made you. It is very important that you accept yourself the way God made you. Why? We are told in the Psalms, Psalm 139 verse 14, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. When you realize that, it helps you to accept whatever you see in the mirror as God's masterpiece. Amen? When I was much younger, I didn't quite like my height because my dad was a seven-footer. But somehow, he married my mom, a pinchomic lady, not quite tall. My dad has a pointed nose. That of my mom is not that too pointed. Whatever you see here is that of my mom. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so at times when I look at the mirror, I'll say, oh, how I wish I'm just a little bit taller than what I am now, something close to, to my dad. At times I'll look at my nose and I wish how, oh, how I wish is a little bit more pointed like that of my dad. Until I started having my kids, my two boys, you need to see them. They are tall, like their grandfather. They have pointed nose, like their grandfather. So that compensated what I was longing for. But now I've come to terms with certain things. I don't need to be tall to be able to enjoy life. I don't need to be fat. When you enter the aeroplane, you need to see what tall people are suffering. Because the distance between chairs, they are so close. You see them, they will keep turning and turning and turning, but me, once I enter, I stretch out my leg because it's short, and I generally relax and sleep. Hallelujah. So we need to appreciate whatever you see as a masterpiece from God. Amen? Then number three, we need to develop a thanksgiving attitude. It is very important. Number four, we need to learn to be content where you are. Contentment simply means satisfaction. Learn to relish today. The psalmist said that this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Learn to enjoy the day through thanksgiving, through praise, and through contentment. When you apply these three things, thanksgiving, praise, and you're satisfied, you find out that, just like Christ said, he said that the issues of the day, that they are sufficient. Don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow might never be yours. Accept the issues of today. And remain grateful all the time. When you do, I can bet you, just like you said, your Heavenly Father, he said, I know your needs and I'm going to meet them. He said, look at the birds of the air, do they so? But yet I feed them every day. He said, how much more you, 
You are created in my image and likeness. And you are the reason why I created the things that I created. That means that whatever you will ever need, God had already put them in place. But the challenge that we are having is lack of knowledge. And God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. He said, and because thou hast forsaken knowledge, therefore will I forsake you. So it's not God's original intention to watch his children suffer. The pressures that we are going through life, some of them are good pressures, some of them are negative. But in the course of our study, we are going to learn how to deal with these negative pressures before they take us out. So are we ready tonight so that we can at least deal with one issue, then we can all go. Know who you are. That is the first thing that we need to deal with in order to maintain a good mental attitude. We need to know the person we are. This deals with the identity crisis. So the four questions that we must address tonight is who are you? Where did you come from? Why am I here on earth? And when I leave this planet earth, where am I going? If we can find answers to these four questions, then it resolves the issue of who you are. Which is a major challenge for a lot of you today, even adults. If you ask some adults now, who are you? You say, I am doctor. <laughs> I am barrister. I am architect. I am engineer. Is that really who you are? So who are you? Number one, you are a special creature of God. The Gospel of John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. He says, there, but to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave them what? He gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. Where does it come from? It comes from God. This fact should influence every thought that enters your mind and everything that you do. You must come to terms with these facts that you are a creation of God and the very moment you accept His Son Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you become his child. I hope you're getting the difference. There is a big difference between being a creation of God and being a child of God. God created mankind in his own image and likeness. But after the fall, the necessity for you to become a child of God came into the picture. And the only way you can become his child and not just his creation is by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Once you do that, a spiritual transaction takes place which is being called born again. Your spirit man is now recreated in the image and likeness of God, and every attribute that makes God God is now inputted into your spirit. So when that takes place, you will be able to confront the difficulties and pressures of life as a child of God 
knowing that you are never alone. Because he said, I will never leave you, nor do what? Forsake you, even unto the end of the ages. So having dealt with that, the second aspect of the identity crisis that we want to deal with is where did you come from? You were created by a loving, almighty God. When you go to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, I will read. It says, in the beginning, the word already existed. He was with God, and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything that there is. Nothing existed that he did not make. Does that answer the question? Where did you come from? You came from a loving, almighty God. He created everything. Then in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, we are told that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made anything at all and is supreme over all creation. Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. He made things we can see and things we can't see. Kings, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. Everything has been created through him and for him. So now you know where you're from. You're direct from the throne room of grace. He existed before everything else began. And he holds all creation together. Who holds all creation together? Christ. So the third question that we need to address this evening, why am I here on earth? Why am I here? Paul affirmed that he was here on earth to serve his Lord. So the main purpose for which we are created is for us to serve God. Because you remember that God is love, and love cannot stand alone. Love needs an object, and we are the object of his love. So because God is love, he created an object for his love. So mankind is the object of God's love. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Alluding to the fact that his primary purpose of being on earth is to serve God. Then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are told, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are created as what? God's masterpiece in Christ Jesus so that we can do what? Do the good things that he planned for us Long ago. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are told that we are Christ's ambassador. As an ambassador, what do you do? You represent your country. You serve your country. You are the final authority in a foreign land. So this planet Earth is not our final abode. We are here as ambassadors to carry out the work of our master. And that was why when the disciples came to him and said, teach us how to pray, he said, pray after this fashion. He said, Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as 
it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. You know the prayer. Some people have fashioned it to be a constant prayer, but it was a transitional prayer. Acknowledging the supremacy of God and also letting us know that planet Earth had been given to mankind and it's up to us to decide what we want to do. It's up to us to establish the will of God to be done here on earth. Then number four, where am I going from here? That's one big question. Does life terminate here on earth? We are told that life is a gift from God. Why is it a gift? Because the life that God had given to you is an opportunity for you to decide where you're going to spend eternity. So when death comes, as it were, it's like your bet into eternity. Not like that's what it is. When death comes, what it simply means, boy, it's time for you to enter into eternity. But if you've not made the right choice of where to spend eternity, because as it were, just like you have the heaven and the earth, you also have what? You have hell and heaven. So the decision where you spend eternity must be taken right here on planet earth. How do I know? It is appointed unto one once to die, after that, judgment. So if you don't take the right decision where you want to spend eternity, it becomes a different ball game. Religion has been deceiving people that they can pray you out of hell. And to ameliorate that, they said they can pray you out of purgatory. With the coming of Jesus Christ, Bogatry was abolished because he led captivity captive. Amen. Amen. So now it's either you accept him or you don't accept him. And if you don't accept him, you're already judged. Because we are told that the only judgment against the world is rejection of Jesus Christ. Period. So there is no two ways about it. So the life that God had given to us is a precious gift for us to be able to decide. So if you've not made that decision tonight, it's an opportunity for you to decide where you want to spend eternity. Because when you leave this planet Earth, you're going somewhere. There is no grammar about that. We need to get that settled. Life does not start and end here. <laughs> we are designed to go somewhere. That's why we are called ambassadors. As an ambassador, when you finish your tenure, what do you do? You go back to your home country. But per adventure, you misbehaved. When you're going back, where are you going? Straight to prison in your home country. Hallelujah. <laughs> And the prison we are talking about as a creature of God is hell. There is hell and there is heaven. Let's make no mistakes about that. And the decision where we spend eternity, we take it right here on earth. So God made you for a purpose and has a plan for your future. He said, I know the plans, the thoughts that I have towards you, they are thoughts of good and not of evil, because I have an expected end for you. That's why he sent Jesus Christ in the first instance to come and die for our sins. But not only to die for the forgiveness of our sins, most importantly, why he came is for the salvation of our spirit and also for us to be able to inherit eternal life. Because when you surrender your life to Christ, 
He does not just forgive your sins. He gives you the gift of eternal life. Amen. Are you not glad? So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Paul, writing to his son Timothy, said, And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that great day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look towards who eagerly look to his glorious return. So there is a prize. There is a crown. You know, when we hear about reward, what usually comes to our mind is this issue of, um, um, how do I put it? Punishment. That's not what the scripture is talking about reward. In sports, you know we have the people they call the judges in athletics. What is the prime responsibility of the judges? Is it to punish people? What is their responsibility? is to decide what awards the athletes will get based on their performances. So when you hear about judgment as it relates to a child of God, it's simply talking about the prize that you're going to win as a result of how you led your life right here on planet Earth. How do I know? Jesus Christ said, let your heart not be troubled. You believed in the heart and now believe in me. I go to prepare a place for you. When he's ready, I will come. He said, in my father's house, there are many what? Mansions. Have you ever seen mansions without boys' quarters? Anywhere you see a mansion, you have boys' quarters. So some people, because they feel in their responsibility towards the father, their reward will be to stay in the boys' quarters. But I've made up my mind <laughs> that I'm going to walk the works of him that sent me while it is day, so that I will be able to get my own crown and get my own mansion. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Did you get something tonight? So we are going to stop here tonight. We've been able to deal with the identity crisis. Now you know who you are. You're not just anybody. You're a child of the Most High God. And you're here on an assignment. And when you're done with that assignment, you're going back to your Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Park, Laduke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.